forgiveness. Oh, God. Oh my gosh. Okay. That was not in my notes. Okay. Ooh. Uh, uh, gosh! In the gut! Get your feathers ready to be ruffled. Y'all ever done the drunk girl prayer? Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I won't drink again. <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody is just standing around like, yeah, this is not gonna be the word that spares feelings today. So if you're easily triggered or sensitive, this video may not be for you. It's a word that needs to be spoken even if it makes people feel good or not. Either step or stay, okay? Either step or stay. Is is anybody seeing what I'm seeing? Shoot, I used to call myself the president of Delululand. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Talks with Tally, a segment on my channel where I speak about the Lord. I have faith talks with you all. Uh, you can call it a podcast, whatever it is that you want, but I bring to you guys the word that the Lord has placed on my heart. I'm not going to lie to you. If you've been here before, I feel like I've always been a pretty uh, real person, right? And I've been very honest and slightly aggressive slash authoritative sometimes, but Today, I'm not gonna lie to you, this word is, it's not gonna stroke your feelings. It's not gonna make your feelings feel good. It's not gonna make you feel comfortable. So I just suggest either, maybe you click off of the video or buckle up. <laughs> so before we get started, let's just pray really quick and get right into the, what the Holy Spirit has to tell us. Father God, I come before you today as your daughter, Lord God, just coming to you to say, Thank you, Lord, for the word that you have placed on my heart, Lord. I want to also say, Lord, please let it be you, Father God, that is speaking. Holy Spirit, put a filter in front of my mouth so it only be you that is speaking, Lord. I don't want in this moment, Lord God, for it to be me, Lord, but you. Let it be you, Lord, speaking the truth, the undiluted truth, Lord, and that every single person the, under the sound of my voice right now, Lord, have a revelation, Lord God, have an experience with you today in this moment, Lord, speak to them specifically and directly, Lord, that they know that it is you speaking to them and showing them the truth of what it is that we are speaking about today, Lord. Let it be you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's get right into it, y'all. For episode four on Talk to Tally, the title is Cancel Culture, A Seed from the Pits of Hell. I'm telling you right now, it's, it's not gonna rub some of y'all the right way. That's why I'm saying in forewarning right now, either step or stay, okay? Either step or stay. This word will be helpful to anyone, truly, in this generation. Um, is it biblically based? Of course. Um, is it a word the Lord has put on my heart? A hundred percent. Additionally, this also has truth in it that even people that may not be believers will see because it's happening right in front of you right now. And I just need to preface this that none of what I am going to say, let me preface again louder, none of what I am going to say, because this is gonna really irk me and upset me. If anybody would like to come and say that I am judging, that I am condemning, that I am thinking myself better than anybody, absolutely not. That is not tolerated here, okay? And I'm getting very serious because I don't play with that. I'm not judging anybody and I am not condemning anybody. This is the truth based on what I have seen and what I have observed, okay? Let me just make that very in abundantly clear, okay? Some of you may understand this truth and some of you may not. And, or you may understand and yet you may not want to admit it. I have to admit that once I began my journey with Christ, I, for real this time, right? When I reconciled my life with Christ, once the veil had been torn and the scales removed from my eyes and I was unblinded, right? When I was able to see again, I finally was able to see all of the hate that truly is in the world. It's hate disguised as love. And trust me, I lived in it. I experienced it. I did it. I performed it. So I know I come from it. And not only did I come from it, I was also surrounded by it. Nowadays in the world, we're seeing lots of people that truly enjoy. They, they love fighting, they love drama, they love gossip, they love 
sexual promiscuity. I love myself so much and I'm so empowered within myself that I'm actually gonna sleep with whoever I want and I'm gonna give myself away, the entirety of myself away to someone that doesn't even deserve it or value it. I did it. And some may not see it that way, but again, I'm continuing. Additionally, I also love myself so much that I'm actually just going to eat myself into death or not eat it all into oblivion. Mental health is so serious, y'all. These spiritual attacks are so serious because I'm not saying that people are choosing to do these things. This is the world and this is the way in which we've been guided by evil. People are loving to be in other people's business and shaming them and publicizing their downfalls. The ocean of confusion that we're swimming in and are surrounded by nowadays, it's overwhelming. It's gotten to an extreme that nobody really wants to talk about because people would rather save their friends' feelings instead of fortifying them in logic and reality. And like I said, I'm going to reiterate, I am no better than anybody, but I have been set free from my previous trauma and now my perspectives have shifted. And that is okay. When you're presented with new information, you have the right to change your mind. And if you wanna think I'm an evil person or I'm a cold person, then if I'm so terrible, then okay, then let, let it be that. But I'm genuinely coming from a place of concern, of love, that there's so much that we are not seeing in the everyday life that's happening in the spiritual realm that people are blinded and they cannot see it or they're choosing to not see it. Maybe this makes me horrible, I don't know. But I have not usually, a majority of the time, been the friend that has spared my friend's feelings when something has happened where their feelings overcame their logic or their re reality, right? All of us have done it, right? We've had a friend that maybe they were in a relationship with someone that was actually terrible and horrific and abusive to them and they still stayed, but yet you had to be the one that told them the truth. Meanwhile, everybody is just standing around like, I'm here if you need anything. I'm the friend, I'm the friend that like, do you not realize? Like, <laughs> like, that's how passionate I am in caring for my friends. And sometimes it did come with me hurting their feelings and that was never the intention. Never is it my intention ever to hurt anybody. It's just sometimes the truth does hurt, especially when you can't see it at first and you need somebody else to help you. Then you question your own judgment. Shoot, I used to call myself the president of Delulu land. <laughs> Today, dilution of truth is not allowed. We are going to begin with three verses, I believe that really sum up this entire word. We're gonna begin with Colossians 3.13. It says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. Galatians 6, 7 to 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. And 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Whatever seeds that we plant will grow and spread, y'all. And there have been seeds among us that have been planted and trees that have grown from them that are from evil. It is our responsibility to cut down that tree and pull it out from the roots. So now you're probably wondering, why is it cancel culture? What are you talking about? What does that have to do anything with what you're talking about? Let's get into it. Cancel culture is defined as a cultural phenomenon in which an individual deemed to have acted or spoken in an unacceptable manner is ostracized, boycotted, shunned, fired, or assaulted. This is often aided by social media. The problem is, is that us as humans, we genuinely, I don't think we know limits. We, we know no limits. Certain movements, trends uh, have reached points, have reached extremes, that they really try their best to attain unreality and or just simply ignore reality. And look, I'm, I'm not a politician, okay? I'm just speaking on what I've seen. That truly is unraveling, it's having a snowball effect and getting bigger every single day. There is an effort moving towards the entire dissipation of order, Lord. You make me say this stuff that nobody wanna hear. Thanks, again, 
Love you. <laughs> and there's this word that everybody keeps on throwing around nowadays and it's boundaries. People love to bring up boundaries and talk about people's feelings and how we should have boundaries in order to protect ourselves and all these things, right? So I'm assuming if we can have feeling boundaries, I'm assuming we can erect logical boundaries, right? Intellectual honesty is being eradicated as we speak. A boundary is something that indicates or fixes a limit or extent. None of these movements originally had the intent to get to the point in which people have brought them to get to. Am I wrong? I, if I'm wrong, tell me. It's gotten to such a radical point, people can't even ask the question now. And I don't believe anybody even has had actually the solution and or answer to this question. Where does it end? Anybody know? How much further does it have to get to for people to realize that we're just living in this huge yes bubble? Everything is allowed. Well, I mean, if everything's allowed, then we might as well just have the purge. Let's go, let's, let's, let's get to it already then. Everything is allowed. Possibilities are truly endless. How outlandish things can get. And I know some of you are gonna hate me for saying this, but at the end of it all, this is what I believe. God's intent is what we should be focusing on. His intent and his context of his word is what matters. It is the pillar of truth. People nowadays take lots of the verses from the word and try to manipulate it. And they don't even really know the context behind what is being said. When I feel like as if, if a lot of people were to truly understand what's really being said and what's expected to result from this word, we actually might have more people agreeing as an example right? This is just stuff I have seen. When it comes to the topic of police brutality, right? The original intent of it all was to stand up against bias of violence, of abuse, of discrimination, injustices enacted towards people and individuals that were being targeted by police officers due to their own racial prejudices. And these people were dying literally for no reason at all which is truly just, it's not right. That turned into a lot of people then saying, okay, let's push for no police at all. Okay, wait, whoa, hold on. In a perfect world, if there were not evil people, we would have never needed them in the first place. But now evil is everywhere. So yeah, we can push towards not having any police officers at all. But in reality, we're still gonna need them regardless because people don't learn. People don't want to love. People don't want to avoid fighting. People can't some people can't so there is still a necessity the body positivity movement i i was in that period i was following that absolutely because i've always been a pretty jacked girl right you know mid-size whatever it may be i was fully supporting this until it came to a radical point where i was like hold on is is anybody seeing what i'm seeing i could have been mistaken but what i knew of this movement was that people were being taught to love themselves in every season and accept themselves as who they are in every season of their life, no matter how they're gonna change, no matter how their bodies change, because we're humans that are deserving of that love. To now, it feels like whether you're too big or too small, the extremes of each are also accepted, but it's because, like I said, a lot of people don't really wanna tell their friends and the people around them and also the people that you follow, like the influencers and celebrities, nobody wants to tell them that's the one body that you have. You will die if you continue on the path that you're on, whether on this extreme or the other. Do you see what I am saying? To me, loving yourself also means taking care of yourself. And that doesn't mean that you need to be fit and tiny and or have abs. That's not what I am saying taking care of yourself holistically, having some type of an active life and keeping yourself moving, doing something. I don't care what you look like. I don't care how big or small you are. I care if you care and you're making efforts to be your best self and be your most healthy self. There's a difference. Now, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, correct? This is not a movement, I would say. It is a community of people, right? Before you come at me with pitchforks, some of you still may want to throw them at me afterwards. At first, I feel like it was lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, to now it's neither binary gender or both or all. And like I said, this is not to offend anybody. This is just genuinely what I see is what's happening. Like, can we just take a second just to take a step back and 
really revel in the unraveling of the actuality that's occurring. And truly, this is not an opinion, but just an observation. And this is the thing as humans, right? Unfortunately, as humans, when we get into positions of, of power, of authority, right? And we want to start these kinds of movements and things like that because there obviously has to be some kind of a change. We have also seen though that a lot of people when they make these movements occur or initiate them, whatever it may be, a lot of people tend to believe that they're doing the right thing. And unfortunately, even when somebody was thinking that they were doing the right thing, it still ended up in destruction. Regardless of the right intent from the heart, the result is still the result. It's still just as damaging. It's still just as scarring and traumatizing. I saw a preacher on YouTube say, if I were to have a device for shooting, I don't know if I could say that word, but if I were to have, a, have this, right? And then I shoot you and I do it out of anger and because I meant to, I meant to hurt you, I meant to injure you. That's, that's obviously wrong. And then he said, let's just say you come to my house and then I'm cleaning that same thing and by accident, somehow you were in the way and I accidentally let it go off. The end result is still that you still got struck. You still got hurt. So whether with good intent or by accident, there's still a repercussion. And that is exactly why it's so important that we be careful what we follow and who we follow. Because being a fan and being a follower are two very different things. And that is something that we'll speak about in the next episode, episode five. I say all this to say that I believe that this exact same thing occurred with cancel culture. Some people attempted to initiate this movement in order to rid this earth of bad people and just keep the good, right? They tried to rid them from, from being accepted into the population without payment or repayment of their transgressions, whether in the form of humiliation, being turned away um, from having a social life or justice legally, like court-wise. Fortunately, now people have actually taken things into their own hands. And then it came to the point that we kept going and then people started to get bullied, harassed, alienated, depressed, fired, stalked, offing themselves and getting threats of and or actual. And this all started with the fact that at least one person thought that someone didn't deserve anything good in life because of an evil thing they did, or maybe multiple evil things that they did. And it's interesting to me because us as people, we love, I say we, because I was also in it too, you know? It's something that the Lord had to work on in me, where it's like, we like to pretend as if we have the right. We like to pretend and or truly believe that we're enjoying that when we're doing this, doing this to people as if we haven't done something wrong, something sinful or evil before. God measures every sin the same. He is our judge. And I'm not saying, I'm not negating that just justice is owed, okay? Because trust me, there have been people that have hurt me too in certain ways that I do believe that had I still been in the world, if I would have gotten my hands on them, I'm not gonna finish that sentence, but that's why we are not called to be the judge. This doesn't negate that evil, vile, and disgusting things don't happen all the time though. But I know a word that says that none of us are better than the other. So when you think yourself to be better than the murderer and the grapeist. Oh, sorry to tell you, we're actually all the same. It's not our job as mere humans to be judging of others because we sin as well. And in turn, because we know no limits and we have pride and we want things to be our way. For some reason, we think that we are qualified to call the shots on earth and we are the most righteous. I mean, I didn't know everybody lived in a class house nowadays. When did that market open up? As Jesus said in his word, let the one of all of you that is without sin throw the stone first. Oh, right. You all suck. I apologize for the word, but that's that's literally what basically is being said here. Luke 6, 37, it says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. And since so many people are seeking power nowadays of some sort, do you realize the amount of power that it truly takes to look someone in the eyes that has done disgusting things and still treat them like a human being with kindness and love regardless of their transgressions? Do you realize the power in unity? Unity, unity, unity. And I'm gonna say it a bunch of times because you need to hear this. 
Romans 16, 17 to 18, it says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacle contrary to the teaching that you learned. Avoid them, because such people do not serve the Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. You're being manipulated to believe that you're valid for saying that this person deserves this and this person deserves that. That's not your call. The enemy has loved to make people feel like because I don't do what they do, I'm actually better. Just because I have not done what that person has done, I actually have a right to say what you deserve. Make it make sense. Actually, maybe you should feel lucky or blessed that you actually haven't been attacked in that way, that you actually haven't had to make those choices and or made those choices, period. That you haven't had that sickness and that possession, demonic possession, let's be honest, to do the things that that person has done. This is not an excuse but this is what happens. But because people don't believe in spirituality, don't believe in the spiritual realm and that these things actually occur, they negate the reality of it. And instead, what that is doing is removing the spirit and causing us to blame our brothers and sisters. Instead, the fault is now on them. That wasn't in my notes, Lord. It's crazy because I literally have had to do this at work. I have, I have to show kindness to the angry drunk. I have to show empathy for the person that's overdosing. I've had to give meds and be the caretaker of a child. R word, the woman beater. I have had to swallow my pride and my bias and my judgments that I would love to make. My flesh would love to make, not my spirit, my flesh. And I have to still show them the same kindness and love that God has showed me. And it hasn't been easy, but it gets a lot easier when you realize that punishment and judgment is not your job. And actually, in any situation, it could have been me if things went differently. Truly, it stems from gratitude that I didn't have to experience what some certain people did. A weight has been lifted when you realize it really has nothing to do with you. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I know an all powerful God that has done that for every single one of us. And some of us have believed it and accepted it into our hearts, into our lives but some have still yet to realize the debt that has been paid for them. I am fully aware that this then fabricates the question, okay, well then what about the people that those people hurt? God's wrath is unmatched, y'all. His vengeance is the one that you want on your team. You're way better off giving it to him and giving him the green light to stand up for you. His word says, I will place a table for you in front of your enemies. And the Lord is fair. Nothing can compare to what he can do for that repayment for what has been done to you. I mean, look at Paul. Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of Christians, although he did give his life to Christ and he served God after all he had done prior to coming to the feet of Christ, he still mm, had to suffer for God's will. There was still repayment and justice. Romans 12, 19, it says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. We want righteousness. We want judgment. But I promise you, even if you get righteousness and judgment, you still need to step over the block of forgiveness. Mm. This is the one nobody wants to hear about. <laughs> There came a point in my relationship with God where I felt like I was stuck. I felt like there was a boulder in the way. I didn't know why I couldn't get closer to God. And then I realized because he revealed to me my pride and my unforgiveness. Pride is defined as the feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements or of those whom they are closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired from one's own self. That's the work of the enemy. He wants us to focus on everything that we can provide for ourselves. It's all about self with him. James 1, 19 to 20, it says, listening and doing. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Slow to speak because out of the abundance of the heart speaks the truth. His word says murder begins in the heart. And that's what he judges. He says, be slow to anger because anger is incredibly dangerous. For me, not letting go was the barrier 
to my closeness with him. And I used to say, I was a part of the whole cancel culture. I used to say, this person did this. Oh, well, I hope they die. This person did this. I hope they get tortured. This person did this. Oh, they better go to jail. They better never see the light of day. They better never experience happiness again in their life. Do you realize how horrible that is? That's horrifying. That is horrifying. Your pride is not worth your salvation. Your pride will keep you in sin. Imagine going to church, right? You accept Christ and then you just leave and then the rest of the days of the week, you just keep doing the same thing. Well, that's a little hypocritical. That's like a little, I don't know. That's a little bit like you're being careless with your salvation. It's something to be kept. It's something to be protected, to be cared for and valued because it wasn't free. There came a point in my life where I didn't want to forgive somebody that's very close to me, is blood to me. And without a doubt, I'm telling you right now, because I've already told this person, had God not stepped into my life and into my heart, there would not have ever been another conversation between me and that person. And probably on that person's end too. And then when I reconciled with Christ, right? And I was like, kept getting revealed to me the topic of forgiveness. The Lord was definitely speaking to me because that was one of the biggest things I was holding on to. There came a point where he was like convicting me and telling me, you realize you're gonna have to go ask for forgiveness, right? And I was like, huh? Why? <laughs> you wanna be forgiven so bad, Natalia? What about you forgiving others? Do what you want to be done to you. Seek what you want to be brought to you. And I remember one day I was washing dishes, right? And the Holy Spirit was convicting me because I was literally getting word after word about forgiveness. You need to go ask for forgiveness, all this other stuff. And I was so prideful. And I literally was washing dishes and I started crying. And I was like, God, God, do you know what it's like to always be blamed for everything when you did nothing wrong? Now imagine those like me that blame God for everything. Things that he wasn't even responsible for, that the enemy was responsible for, that free will was responsible for. <laughs> my own free will, for allowing the things that I set up for myself to occur. And just as a tiny example, y'all ever done the drunk girl prayer? Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I won't drink again. <laughs> it's just a small thing. Imagine the bigger things that we have probably promised and not kept. And so I believe it was actually a, a week or so after that, I finally was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it anyway. Because boldness and courage, it requires you to do things against your own feelings and what you wanna do. So I ended up going to that person's house and I asked for forgiveness anyways, even though I physically, I did not want to. I was dying to my flesh right there. And that's the thing, I denied my own feelings. And I asked God, I prayed before I went into that house and I said, Lord, please give me the courage, give me the strength to do this because I don't want to. I said it just like that. I was like, God, I don't want to do it. Am I going to do it anyways? Yeah, I'm going to do it. And I noticed how in that moment, as I was speaking to that person, I slowly felt the weight of the unforgiveness get chipped away. That was my boulder in the way. Wow, Lord. I literally physically felt the weight lift off my shoulders. He says, forgive for you to be forgiven. Forgive, because with the same measure that you forgive, God will also forgive you. Genuinely, in cancel culture, the only thing I can think about is who are we? We all know what happened to the last person that tried to do God's job. I'm just saying. We all know about him. Matthew 5, 38 to 48, it says, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He is saying, add, Lord, 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 this is the revelation the Lord gave to me last night when I was preparing this word. It says, he is saying, add and multiply unto those who hurt and trespass against you. The number two signifies difference, whether evil or good, but it signifies difference. And that's what we must be. When Jesus enters, he blesses by subtracting your ungodliness. Lord, by adding himself into the equation. And when you add him in, there needs to be difference. There needs to be a change. Verse 43, it says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect. Cancel culture is rooted in pure, unfiltered, evil, unforgiveness, and pride. So take your pride for a ride and call it a day. 
deuces, because a kingdom divided shall not stand. The thing with the word unity, right? This is the grand scheme. <laughs> of this whole thing that people are not seeing. This is exactly what's happening in the spiritual realm right now. The spiritual warfare that's going on that I haven't talked about yet on my channel, but episode four, we are talking about it, Lord. Okay, let's get right into it. Then let's get into the depth of what's actually happening here. There is a spiritual war going on that nobody is even aware of. Some of us are, but some are, are, are not really seeing it that way, but it's happening. The devil, Señor, reprendan en el nombre de Jesús. The enemy wants us all divided, not as one. He doesn't want unity. Unity is the state of being united or joined as a whole, as one. Romans 15, five to six, it says, now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. When we make others outcasts, it makes us put our pos ourselves in the position of God. And the thing is that's so crazy about it all is that the things that we say against each other, like you don't deserve a chance, you don't deserve life, you don't deserve happiness, they don't deserve da 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 Not even God says that about us when he judges us. What? Even, <laughs> I just can't, I can't. He doesn't even say that when he has to judge us because we've done something wrong. So how much worse are we actually being? And so as you can probably imagine, if we're being so much worse and we're actually doing contrary to what God is doing, does that not mean that it is actually against God. It is not God that is instilling these thoughts into our minds. Hello, wake up, take off the blindfold. So who do you think is behind this whole plot and scheme to divide us all? Think really hard. It's gonna be so difficult to figure it out. A lot of times there's no excuse. Actually, there is no excuse for us to trample over God's grace, especially when you know God. But remember, it's God's choice to have grace, not yours. I, da I dare you to try to love somebody that you feel better than. Yeah, sit in that one. Psalms 103, eight to 10, it says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger as we should be, hello, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. That makes me wanna cry. <laughs> Isn't that how we must be more Christ-like? He wants us to be more Christ-like. Well, isn't forgiveness closer to that? His word says, forgive seven times 70. Let's see what it says. It says, this is exactly what he did on earth. It says, Matthew 6, 14 to 15. It says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Do you know how many times forgiveness is in the word? God. Forgiveness is, is not just a command but a condition to your relationship with the Lord. Ooh, he has unconditional love, but there are conditions to you receiving his forgiveness. Oh, God, oh my gosh. Okay, that was not in my notes. Okay, well then. Matthew 18, 21 to 22, it says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. You know how many times your parents probably made you hug your sibling after you guys were fighting and you didn't want to anyways? <laughs> That's what he's calling us to do. Matthew 18, 33 to 35. This is just word, 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 y'all. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Isaiah 59, one to two, it says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. God may not hear your prayers if you are unforgiving. Many of us have gotten used to division. You over there, us over here, when that's not how it should be. I'm here to remind you that the weight has made you numb. The weight of your pride and unforgiveness and making you, your, making yourself your own God has made you numb. You don't even know that it's there anymore. You can't realize it because, or recognize it because it's already a part of you. It has fused to you. And that's the thing, you won't even know lightness until you truly feel the weight of that being lifted off of you. I don't know why I wrote this, but I put in here, in this world, people are thinking that they are God, right? The God of their own life. As if you have the final say on when your life is over 
or what your life purpose is. Nobody knows the day nor the hour. Nobody knows when is their last breath. He dictates that. I'm also going to get into something that's very serious right now when it comes to that topic, being your own God. I need you to understand what's actually happening spiritually when it comes to this topic. I'm just going to read it from here because I need you to understand. I need to be able to look down and also talk to you directly without stopping here. The enemy has people thinking that they are God because he wants people to think that they're self-sufficient. And you know why? Because he could never be God. So he makes his children, the children of the enemy, who believe that they can be God because he couldn't do it. So what is he going to do? Pass it down to you. Oh, Lord, God may have created us, but which father are you letting raise you? Lord, he is known as the father of evil. John 8, 41 to 47, it says, you are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Hello? Because you were unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil and you wanna carry out your father's desires. He was a murder from the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, the language of lies, and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Uh, uh, gosh, in the gut, in the gut, Lord. Wow. The enemy can no longer be a rebellious son against God because God no longer claims him as his. You can only truly rebel to someone superior to you. A rebel is a person who rises in opposition or armed resistance against an established government or ruler. That's the thing. God ain't going nowhere. So remember that the Pharisees will also try to make you look bad. It's almost as if you weren't anointed. Everything that happened in the Bible is happening now. And same thing with Christians. There's plenty of Christians that they do not actually preach the word of God, the true word of God, the truth. But again, the problem is, is that because there have been a few tainted ones in the group, cancel culture says, cancel the whole group. Jesus spoke in parables a lot of the time, and not only was it to fulfill prophecy, but does anybody realize the other reason for it? Jesus, whilst doing that, also was opening the door to individual revelation. The word is endless. Not to create our own meanings, but to let him speak to us in a way that we understand individually. Be careful, because in this world now, and I'm closing up now, the enemy's biggest and most common tool is for self-destruction. To destroy you. This isn't a game, this isn't a joke. It's to destroy you. He wants to end your life and your purpose, your ministry. And by doing this, he has created a lot of people to believe that they themselves are greater than God and greater than others. It's in the world of self. It's in self praise, self worship. It's in making you yourself everything you ever need. Hence hustle culture also burning people out to the point where they can't take no more because they have no community, have no God, have nobody to lean on when we were not meant to be alone. So when times get rough because they do, he tries to build you up just to tear you down the same way that he did to Jesus when he brought him up there to tempt him. And this was solely just to see him fall. Mm. Be aware y'all because he wants you to seek answers within yourself as if you have the answers when Jesus is the answer. And he says so in his Beatitudes in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, it says they are blessed because they have an answer. They have a reason and he is the reason. Ooh, you didn't breathe the breath of life into your own lungs. And I don't know why I'm saying this, Lord. I don't know why I'm saying this, but that time that you should have died and you didn't miraculously, he did that, not you. It's 1 Peter 4, 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Love has the power to overcome all of our offenses and also the ones committed against us. So when you choose love over pride, over unforgiveness, over self, it leads to healing and restoration, which you can only find through him. He is the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. So I encourage you all 
to seek him. Let's pray, because that, that was a lot. Father God, I just want to come before you, Lord, to say thank you so much for that word that you have placed on my heart, Lord. I want to give you all the glory, Father God, for revealing the truth to us today, Lord. God, in this moment, I ask you for every single person across that screen, Lord God, under the sound of my voice, Lord, I ask that in this moment, Father God, it be you touching them, Lord God, giving them an encounter with you, Lord, that they be able to see the truth of what it is that is happening in this world, Lord, and be able to turn their face and their gaze towards you, Father God, because you are the truth and you are the way, you are the life, Lord. Only in you and through you can we actually find true anything, Lord. True happiness, true love, true light. I bless them all in your name, Jesus. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Lord, wow. I encourage you to get to know Jesus and accept him into your heart as your savior. To repent and ask for forgiveness of all your sins and start over with him. And it's just as simple as just praying that. And if you don't know God and you want to know God and see what really, what's up over here on this side, <laughs> then pray to him. And I promise you, your life will change. Thank you all for joining me on this episode of Talks with Tally. And I will see you guys in the next one.